it was in the forefront of everything, I think, uh, back then when uh, June 12 was in the news. Bashar Dele Momodu, publisher of Vision, former presidential aspirant, amongst many, many other things. You're very welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Ebuka. Thank you very much for being yeah. here. Also, our Bamiji, President Bola Ege Center for Justice. Thanks for being here today. And, of course, Chetan Wanze, writer, youth advocate, social media commentator, and radical. <laughs> That's my word. I want to start with you, Nasan. I want to start with a very interesting quote that I saw over the week. Um, it said, it is those who don't have anything to offer this country with regard to moving it forward that can still be talking about the June 12 presidential elections. I am not one of those people. That is why I don't like talking about it. This was from Alahaji Bashir Tofa. What did you think when you saw that quote? Ah, well, I saw it via a tweet, and I responded that he was suffering from delusion of grandeur. Uh, you can't rewrite history. The man was randomly and soundly defeated, even in Kano. So, uh, I'm sure he has not fully recovered 20 years after from that beating. And that is why someone will say it didn't happen. Nigeria, as a matter of fact, is in crisis today because we refused to learn any lessons from June 12th. On that day, Nigerians came together as one. They didn't complain about religion. They didn't complain about ethnicity. They didn't complain about money. There was not a single fight anywhere in the world. It was such a mysterious and mystical election. And then some people chose, for whatever reasons, that that election should be killed. You see, when you commit murder, there's a penalty. And we're paying that penalty now. Does it bother you that the head of state at the time has not officially come out till today to apologize or even explain why that announcement happened? Does it bother you? I've written and written about it, but I understand something. I think it's all about military discipline. Uh, he has taken full, uh, full responsibility for the action, but he has not been able to disclose the, I hate the word, but I will repeat it, the cabal. You see, every government in Nigeria has that problem. Once you get to power, then the mafioso will come and take over the reins of power. And that's what happened. I'm sure he did not do it alone. We have an idea. I mean, I discussed this with the late, the late Bashar Rabiola before he died. And we have an idea of those who were behind it, those who went to poison his mind to say, oh, why do you want to hand over to this man? Because they believe he was too strong a man. To because they always like weakness. You see, we live in a mafia nation where people like those they can control. But it always backfires. Is it because they put someone there, when the person gets there, then he becomes the enemy. Then they start lamenting like Jeremiah. That's what is happening. <laughs> Oh, he said something very interesting here about, you know, this is why we're still here today. Do you think that's one of the reasons why when we have so many issues in the country today? It looks like with every day, there's even more things to deal with. Yeah. How much of a role has that June 12 annulment played in today's Nigeria? Uh, from my own perspective, I think we have not learned any lesson whatsoever from June 12. Because if June 12 annulment has played a role in our life, we will have, we'll have reversed the electoral process back to what we experienced in June 12, which was an uh, open ballot system, and it was the best so ever we had in Nigeria. So that is my own perspective. We have not learned our lesson, and that, that is the reason why we activists, we keep on saying it, that until we learn some lesson from the annulment, and then we try to trace our step back. So that is where we will be saying that we are hoping for a better Nigeria in, in this country. So you, you, I believe were, I don't know how old you are, but I want to believe you are around my age at the time. I was very young, and I just remember going home to my village for about two to three months because it was almost like a national compulsory holiday, which was unfortunate. Where were you at that time, and what are the memories you have of 1993, June? The memories I have, um, my father had just withdrawn me from boarding school at that period. Um, one of the reasons was he saw things like this coming, and he wanted us close by so that we were able to keep an eye on everybody. Um, being that uh, ethnically we are Igbo, we, um, there was this historical memory of what happened yeah. um, 30 years earlier. So he didn't want any of his flock too far away. Um, I grew up in Benin, and we stayed in Benin for the period. But everywhere there was this atmosphere of ego happened, ego happened, there's going to be another war. 
there was this, uh, there was that atmosphere. Um, luckily, that didn't happen. Um, unfortunately, we ended up being blessed with Abacha, if I'm to use that expression. <laughs> and um, Abacha took us through what we never thought possible. Because, um, you see, the difference between Abacha and Babangida was that um, Babangida felt it needs to be liked. So he had this settlement culture where if you are talking too much, somebody will come and visit you with either the, the bullets or the gold, and you have to choose one. Abacha will just visit you with the bullets. Um, so in a way, this is counterintuitive, but in a way, June 12 was a blessing for Nigeria. Why? Because... It showed us, it enabled us to go down a path where we saw what was possible in the country in terms of how deep we could sink. And one of the things that, even though we are, we are not there yet, but one of the many fights that is happening is people who are like, no, it shall not happen again. You still have a few mad people who look back to the days of Abacha with um, nostalgia and say, oh, it was better for us then. <laughs> and I say, people were using sawdust to cook then. So how was it better? Yes, things look really bad now, but we needed that to happen. So, picking up from there now, have we really learned? Because that's, that's, that's my biggest issue now. Yes, I, I get your point, and it was actually an epiphany for me when you said that. It was a bit of a blessing in disguise that June 12 happened, because we, we, the next eight or so years were pretty much hell for Nigeria. But have we learned anything, seeing where we are today, and the sort of tension that is in the policy in the run of 2015? Trust, trust me, we haven't learned anything. There was an annulment 20 years ago, and we've just gone through another annulment. The governor's forum thing. You know, that is what happens when you condone rubbish. It will always repeat itself. Because some people did it, and somehow they got away with it. Of course, today, some people have the audacity to try it again. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in 2015. But they're already telling us. Everything in Nigeria is about money, ethnicity, religion. When in other places, I mean, if you look at Dubai, they build the tallest building in the world. That's ambition. Now, in Mecca, they are saying, no, how can Dubai build the tallest building in the world? We must build something taller. That's what I expect Nigerians to be discussing today. Look at the roads. I've been to the Redeem Camp and back today. And it's still the same old thing, grass in the middle of the room. Things that we should not even be talking about. Nobody is talking about infrastructure. Nobody is talking about education. Nobody is talking about health. Nobody is talking about anything. We landed at the airport yesterday in Lagos. The first thing that I welcomed was, was odor, oozing from the toilets. Simple things. The basic things of life we can't even provide. And we are fighting over who will be president, who will not be president. What does it matter? 2015 is not a personal issue. I don't care. 